Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, or FASD, is more common and more costly in this country than previously believed. It's also very likely that the condition, which often includes lifelong brain damage, is underdiagnosed. That all according to a new study looking at children in the Greater Toronto Area. The study's lead investigator is Svetlana Popova. She is senior scientist at CAMH's Institute for Mental Health Policy Research. And also with us tonight, Deborah Goodman, Director, Child Welfare Institute, the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. And we are pleased to welcome both of you to our studio here tonight uh, for uh, a very troubling topic, which we need to know more about. Let's set up our discussion with this. This is from the World Health Organization. Alcohol can readily cross the placenta, interfering with the normal progression of the embryo and resulting in damage to the brain and other organs of the developing fetus. Despite the risk, a significant number of pregnancies are alcohol exposed. It was recently estimated that in Canada, 10% of women consume alcohol while they are pregnant. That's a little bit about FASD for background. Now, Lana, I want to ask you about your new study, which I have heard described as a landmark study in FASD. How come? This study was urgently needed in Canada because we did not know how many people exist with this very disabling condition. And this number will really help us now to uh, try to get support for people which exist with FSD, support in terms of services, treatments, interventions. This number will also help us to prevent this dis disabling condition in future children, uh, to uh, prevent them to being born with this condition. Also, these numbers will uh, help us to, to show the government uh, severity and magnitude of this problem in Canada. The headline here is that this is much more prevalent than we previously thought, right? Deborah, what's, what, what did we previously think the prevalence was? Uh, generally, as researchers, we would quote about 1% of the population. And so with uh, Lana's study now indicating it's 2 to 3%, that's a significant um, increase, which uh, probably now exceeds the prevalence for autism. How did the, more than autism now, eh? More than autism. How did the earlier number, 1%, come to be sort of the accepted general wisdom at the time? For a long time, we thought that the prevalence is 1%, but indeed, uh, we did not have any epidemiological population-based study. This number came from very old American studies, and we used this as a crude prevalence rate. But indeed, we did not know uh, exactly how many people exist in hmm. Canada with this condition. Let's bring up a chart here, if we can. And this is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder broken down into some subcategories here. And you can both see on the monitor here what's going on. Lana, maybe do you, do you want to take us through this and just sort of explain? This is for suspected FASD cases among elementary school students in the greater Toronto area. Take us through this. Correct. Uh, we identified 21 students with suspected FASD among over 2,500 students, which we screened in Greater Toronto area among elementary school children from seven to nine years of age. We identify three uh, students with fetal alcohol syndrome, two with partial fetal alcohol syndrome, and 16 with neurodevelopmental disorder. How did you diagnose it? Um, we followed 2005 Canadian guidelines because we started this study in 2011. Uh, we invited all students uh, from grade two to four to participate in, in our study. And we physically, actively, we were assessing them, seeking and finding cases of FSD among this population. So we assess all children on growth deficits because uh, people with FAS might have growth deficits. We assess them on facial features. Uh, we take histories from teachers and parents on behavioral and learning problems of the children. And those who uh, were eligible based on certain criteria, uh, we uh, proceeded them into the second phase where we assess these children on neurodevelopmental status. Basically, okay. we uh, assess them on memory, attention, uh, motor skills, executive functioning, and many other variables. Gotcha. And Deb, just so we're clear here, these are, these are young people who we think have these disabilities because they were exposed in utero to too much alcohol. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. I mean, the underlying premise is 
FASD can only be acquired through maternal drinking during the pregnancy. Okay, let's go through some of, because, uh, you know, there are $26 million over four years worth of initiatives that apparently have been announced here uh, by the province of Ontario, uh, which is, uh, I guess, more awake to the problems that this uh, condition creates. Uh, here's some of it. Create one-stop access to information and training resources. Provide funding for more than 50 FASD workers to support approximately 2,500 Ontarians with FASD. Increase access to FASD initiatives developed by Indigenous partners. Create a research fund to learn more about FASD and how to prevent it. Uh, that's what the Ministry of Children and Youth Services is up to. Deb, based on your knowledge of this issue, what kind of impact is that going to have? It's a start. It's a great start. And our ministry has certainly taken leadership in recognizing FASD as a significant public health issue. Um, but it's a beginning, not an end. Uh, some of the struggle that we have in the province and across Canada is actually having enough um, diagnostic um, services to actually take children to to be diagnosed with FASD. Uh, so it's a great start. Um, Given this landmark study, though, do we have to reevaluate the 2,500 Ontarians that today we suspect have FASD? Yes, this certainly indicates that there's a lot more uh, children and youth out there with FASD than initially thought, significantly more. Okay. How willing were mothers of children with fetal alcohol syndrome to pr uh, participate with your study? It's a very good question. Um, only about 42% of mothers agreed to be interviewed. And of course, here uh, we have to talk around stigma. Uh, because uh, usually women are not um, willing to disclose their uh, alcohol consumption during pregnancy due to fear of being um, judged. Um, and this was one of the major reasons why we believe that our prevalence rate is underestimated because for certain diagnoses of FASD, such as partial FAS and alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, we need confirmation of maternal alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. But based on this quite low response rate from mothers, we believe that we're still missing some children. We, I mean, the purpose of this tonight is not to uh, blame mothers. We don't want to increase stigma. We don't want, we're not here to jacuse. We're not here to do that kind of thing. But we are here to understand. And Maybe you could help us understand, Deb, are, are there still women who get pregnant who don't know that taking a drink of alcohol or taking too much alcohol during pregnancy is not a good thing? Yes, and I think part of our society's messages are quite mixed about that. Um, you know, it's okay to have a drink now and then during pregnancy. Uh, this research and, and others that are being done around the country, and we, we have some leading researchers that are focused on FASD, would say there's no amount known that is safe. Zero. And zero. So the second you know you're pregnant, stop drinking, period, full stop. Right. Really? Correct. Um, and, and I think part of it is, is very much like the messages around don't drink and drive. We need to relay so that each and every Canadian understands if, the, if there's a pregnancy, the mother should not be drinking. She should stop immediately. But if we're making the analogy to drinking and driving, the law doesn't say you can't have any True. alcohol in your system when you drive. They say True. you can't blow over 80. True. So does that analogy work here? Well, it works, I think, from the point that we know of the incredible harm that occurs to the fetus with alcohol. It is disabling. It's, it is a cradle-to-grave issue that does not go away uh, and has life consequences for that child. And so whether there's a law or not, that is the outcome. Do you think there are still many mothers out there who do not understand that any alcohol consumption during pregnancy can be dangerous? Um, I think it's not only about understanding. I think majority of women um, would not simply know that they are pregnant because majority would know only up to four, six months of uh, pregnancy and they continue to drink and damage can be done during this period of time. Another reason may be uh, because women are misinformed uh, by social media, by researchers, by family members or friends which say that it's okay to drink one glass of wine once 
in a while during pregnancy. Is that your view? Is it's, it okay? It's not okay. It's a very dangerous message. The only message which we should send to our public is there is no safe amount of alcohol and there is no safe type of alcohol to drink during pregnancy and even when women are trying to get pregnant. So the safest approach, safest message is zero alcohol during entire nine months of pregnancy. I hear what you're saying, but you do know there are a whole lot of people my age who, and I'm not making a personal comment here, but you know, in, in our generation, mothers smoked and drank during pregnancy all the time. And a lot of us turned out okay. <laughs> so how, you know, again, is there, is there a difficulty here with saying zero alcohol whatsoever when we know for a fact that, you know, for most people, it's not gonna be an issue if they sneak a drink once every now and then. <laughs> yes, this is a common perception. And I think uh, this is a major source of misinterpretation or misinformation. Uh, That's why our women are confused with these mixed messages. Um, we have to take this solid evidence that alcohol is teratogen, which means that alcohol can damage any cells of the developing fetus. The major target of alcohol is brain. That's why people with fetal alcohol syndrome uh, experience so many uh, cognitive difficulties, such as learning difficulties, uh, problem solving um, difficulties, um, language, communication, memory, attention. But alcohol can also damage other cells of developing fetus. Um, and we recently estimated that people with FSD have over 400 disease conditions, comorbidities associated with uh, FSD. Oh my goodness. Well, and, at, in which case, at what age do we have to start telling young people, if you're pregnant, don't drink? If you think you're pregnant, don't drink? I think the beginning of high school is a good place to start that message. Grade nine. Grade nine. Hmm. Um, we know our students, um, many do drink as they get into their high school years. Uh, and pregnancy is, uh, is a risk for some. Um, part of the, the focus of, of the area of research that I do is around high-risk uh, populations. Uh, one of them is child welfare, uh, of which the prevalence rate for FASD is 10 to 15 percent. So hmm. a child with FASD will be much more likely to come into contact with child welfare, much more likely to come into contact with youth justice, again, a high prevalence rate there. Um, and so we, I think we need to start early and frequently with the public around pregnancy and drinking don't mix. FASD is a problem that could disappear tomorrow. It could. Right? As long as pregnant women stop drinking alcohol. It could. It's completely preventable. Hmm. You wanted to say? It sounds easy, but uh, we should not forget about those women who are alcohol addicted. <laughs> That's why it's so important to establish a universal screening. Medical doctors, obstetricians must ask questions about alcohol consumption of women of childbearing age, identify such women with uh, alcohol problems, and refer them for substance abuse treatments. We should not give the impression here that this is all on women. How about young no. men? Uh, I was just going to make that point. Okay. Uh, because, it, again, often, you know, if we're saying, let's get together and have a drink, it's not just women that do that. Men are equally there as well. And so for partners, husbands, boyfriends, uncles, cousins, neighbors, to support the woman in not drinking during the pregnancy, and especially those that may have um, alcohol addiction issues as they enter their pregnancy. Um, immediately go and see a doctor, uh, and again, provide support to help them stop drinking. What about Lana's point, though, that I mean, you can be three months pregnant and not know you're pregnant, Correct. and and just, you know, go out on a Friday night and have a drink like you always did. Correct. How do we, how do we get around that? Again, I think it's through public education around... But if you don't know you're pregnant... Um, and then again, if those women that are in bearing years for children need to take extra precautions. Gotcha. Let's show, oh sorry, Lana, you wanted to make a point. I just wanted to make a point uh, of that's why how important to plan your pregnancy. Plan your pregnancy and not drink alcohol um, within two, three months before 
uh, women get pregnant Understood. in order to be on the safe side and not damage sure. developing fetus. We should actually show people what we're talking about here yeah. because the European Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders Alliance has put together a video to raise awareness about this. So, Sheldon, let's show that if we can. Go. Join efforts with us to educate all women across the globe about the risks of drinking during pregnancy. I didn't know drinking could harm my child. I didn't know that my baby had to process alcohol. My name is Dominic, and I am nearly 13, and I go to a special school because because I have fecal alcohol syndrome. Fasty can be prevented. Please help us raise awareness of the risks of drinking in pregnancy. Okay, I gather in Europe they, they call the acronym FASD. Here we call it FASD. Okay. But, but if once you have it, you have it, for, I mean, do you have the symptoms for life? Yes. There's no coming back. Um, unfortunately, no. Prenatal alcohol damage is irreversible and it stays for whole life. That's why FASD is very serious disabling condition. And um, it's associated with a wide range of effects from mild to severe and may include uh, mental disabilities, physical disabilities, learning problems and behavioral problems. Deb, if you didn't know in that video that Dominic who says he has it, mm -hmm. has it, you might diagnose that as any other number of different things, right? Is this something that's been misdiagnosed over the years? Yes, and again, part of it, as professionals are trained, we all are trained in different decades, and if that isn't part of your training and learning, mm -hmm. that may not be um, first and foremost on your mind. We often call them blind spots. Uh, and so he may very well be diagnosed with a learning disability. He may have an autism diagnosis. There may be other diagnoses that come, but not the FASD. And the FASD diagnosis is a really important one because with that, the child can also get ODSB and supports. Disability support plan. Disability In support Ontario. plan, thank yeah. you. Um, and other supports like respite. Uh, where the parent can uh, get supports in parenting that child. Um, education. Winnipeg has an amazing program for children with FASD that take them from kindergarten all the way through to high school and graduate them. Um, but there's supports that go with those programs. Beyond supports though, if, if, I mean obviously you want to diagnose a condition properly so that it can be treated properly. Uh, how much mistreatment do you think of, of young kids with FASD has happened in the past because we didn't know what it was? We thought it was something else. That's right. As Deb said, um, these kids uh, usually, uh, in most cases actually, misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all or simply ignored. Uh, our study is uh, clearly shows this. Uh, because none of these children, 21 children, which we identified during our study, were previously diagnosed with FASD. Oh, so these are all new diagnoses. Absolutely new hmm. diagnoses. And uh, obviously parents do not know what's going on with their kids. And these kids, I'm sure, exhibit lots of different problems, including learning, uh, behavioral. Uh, so as Which puts them more at risk for intersection with child welfare. Hmm. which is why we have a 10 to 15 percent prevalence rate. We, we do ask teachers to do an awful lot though. And we do. Is it asking too much to ask them to be able to identify um, an FASD kid in their midst if they see one? Or if they a think they again, see one? Again, it's, it's often an invisible uh, issue where their behaviors are what's um, front and center, mm -hmm. um, not evident that their brain isn't working in the way that they're intended. And so for a child with FASD, the teacher who moves their children frequently in their classroom to, to get them to sit beside different ones, for a child with FASD, that would be a very difficult um, switch and may act up. And so the teacher may not have a, a sense that FASD is actually um, the issue. Gotcha. At Children's Aid we, in Toronto, we actually screen uh, for FASD hmm. when they come into care. We've got about 20 seconds left, so I'll give it to you. There are many different reasons why children with FASD are misdiagnosed or uh, not diagnosed at all. First of all, FASD diagnosis is very complex and it requires a multidisciplinary team, which includes pediatricians, uh, physicians, 
dysmorphologists, geneticists, and many other specialists. And it takes time, time consuming, and very expensive. We estimated that diagnostic of FASD uh, cost around 3,500 Canadian dollars up to 5,000 Canadian dollars. Well, can I say, we know a lot more about it now than we did <laughs> 20 minutes ago. So I thank the two of you for coming in tonight and helping us out with this. Dr. Svetlana Popova, Deborah Goodman, appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.